What's up, guys? Rick here with your DFS preview for this week's AT&T Byron Nelson, a new course on the schedule as well, so plenty to talk about, but my goodness, Roy McElroy back in the winner's circle, which put a lot of you and myself also in the winner's circle. I saw that there were plenty of uh, Roy McElroy winning tickets. I know a lot of us are holding uh, PGA Championship tickets on Rory that are much longer than the current odds that you can get. So little golf clap, clap. Congratulations. Obviously, uh, my goal with my site, rickrungood.com, is to provide as much data as possible to make the research process easy, streamlined, effective, and help the community. Uh, members of the community found big wins last week. There were countless uh, DMs and Slack messages, but I'd like to point out a couple of these. First of all, Johnny turned his $72 into $786, which I thought was nice because uh, he had a deep run in the single entry. Uh, he was living that single entry life and keep knocking at the door, Johnny, eventually that is going to open up for for you, but the big winner, Glenn, wins my favorite contest on DraftKings, the $200 single entry. I thought I was sniffing it for a couple of minutes there on Friday before Bryson went all, you know, a triple bogey on number seven, but Glenn takes it down $200 into $50 thousand dollars congratulations Glenn absolutely stoked for you and if you want to use the tools for rickrungood.com I highly encourage it go over there and sign up or or in addition to you can enter a draw to win a subscription, and I've got two winners here, Dan Brewer and Jim's Remax. Uh, you guys have won subscriptions to rickrungood.com. I've already reached out to you. I will get you all set up, and if you would like to win an entry or Enter the draw, I guess is a better way to say it, for a subscription to rickrungood.com. There are two ways to do it. Like this video, make sure you're subscribed to this YouTube channel, and comment below with who is going to win the AT&T Byron Nelson. That is one. Go down in the link in the description, click on the podcast version of this show. It's called 300 Yards to Unknown. Leave a five-star rating and review on iTunes. Say something nice about the show and leave me your Twitter handle. That's entry way number two. Do them both. Double your chances. There's going to be plenty of content this week. Goal is to have uh, the bets video out on Tuesday as usual, the sleepers video out, trying to get the fades video back out. That is uh, highly requested. I've been using that time to build the database. Some good things coming in the future. So hoping to get fades back on the schedule this week. And then, of course, the 3 p.m. Eastern Wednesday live chat for all things Byron Nelson. And then also the 8.15 p.m. Eastern time jock market power hour. That's Wednesday night. That's That'll be going on. It's a little bit of stock market DFS. It is a ton of fun. And there was lots of money to be made uh, with some of the penny stocks last week, especially in the jock market. I think that's all the announcements for this week. Let's jump into TPC Craig Ranch. All right, here we go. Here's the course. It's uh, TPC Craig Ranch. It's obviously part of the TPC Network. It is a course that has not been used for the PGA Tour before. It's been used for a couple of Corn Ferry Tour events, but uh, we're going to do a lot of guessing. We're going to do a lot of just kind of interpreting things, but I actually do think we have some decent information this week, all things considered. It is a par 72. I describe it as very standard par 72. I'll show you that in a second. 7,400 yards, but we're starting to already Ready get some boots on the ground, some inside information, seeing how it's playing. I think it can play a lot longer than this, uh, than the 7,400 yards on the scorecard, depending on how they set it up, depending on the wind direction. I think this can be a bit of a bigger uh, ballpark. Bent grass greens, and it's a Tom Weiskopf design. The greens are on uh, the larger side, 6,700 square feet on average. That puts it on par with, uh, let's see... Tory, uh, no, I guess Tory Pines is a lot smaller. Uh, these are a little bit bigger than Augusta National, a little bit smaller than the club at nine bridges, 83 bunkers. And you will see a stat, or you could see a stat that says there are 13 holes where water is in play. I believe they're also counting this. Um, I don't know if it's a river, a meandering creek, whatever you want to call it. It's not very wide. It kind of meanders throughout the course. So it is technically in play. I don't know how much it's actually going to come into play uh, on a lot of these on a lot of these holes, but there are a few holes that have 
bodies of water that I would be much more concerned about. Um, here's the scorecard. So this is the official scorecard. This is from the media site. And the uh, a couple of things to note. In the tournament preview that I released on Sunday, I included a link to a, f a drone flyover for TPC Craig Ranch that was done a couple of months ago, and it was an excellent resource. I will also include that in the description here as well. But what here's here's what I saw. You know, this is a course that uh, both nine and eighteen are par fives. It's your tra traditional four par threes, por four par fives. Uh, the only hole that I really think is going to be an issue is this one right here. It's number thirteen. It's a five hundred and twelve yard par four. It's a very long par four. It looks as if it's playing uphill, and I think that a making four pars there over the course of the week is going to be an excellent score. But then you go to number 14, the very next hole. Well, that looks to me like a drivable par four, especially depending on where they place the tees. The scorecard yardage is 330 yards. So we also have a couple of other par fours. So 13 is a par 4, 330. 6 is a 361-yard par 4. The par 3s are all over 200 yards except for number 17. That's a, that's a small one. That's only 147 yards. And then you look at the par 5s that check in at 570, 564, 547, and 552. Those, to me, are probably all reachable by the majority of the field. And if you go and you watch the flyover, which I highly encourage you to do... I don't see much trouble. I don't see much resistance. There are a handful, a couple, I don't even want to say a handful, a couple of holes that if you are, you know, missing the fairway, if you're a bit loose, you could find some trees. There's like one or two that I'd be worried about a penalty area, but otherwise there is just a lot of room out there. Uh, you can almost, to me, it seems like bomb it without regards for much accuracy, uh, which is going to come into play for a couple of guys and especially one in particular. But to me, uh, without any winds kicking up or without something that I'm not seeing, this appears like it's going to be a birdie fest. Uh, maybe 20 under par, maybe deeper than that. Obviously, we can get those Texas winds that can that can cause some some havoc at times, but this, to me, seems like a very gettable course. I highly encourage you to go watch the, the drone flyover, make the, um, you know, the, the assumptions for yourself, but I'm going with lots of birdies this week and most of these par fives just being absolutely decimated by the field. So how does that relate to what we're going to look for this week? Well, if you if you scroll down here on the course key stats page, um, you know I had I had some really good success last week uh, lowering the recent number of of rounds. So I'm just going to look at the last 24 rounds and and go for strokes gained off the tee. I think first and foremost, this is obviously your combination of uh, distance and accuracy and just hitting hitting putting yourself in a in a position to make a better score than your peers. And of course, Bryson DeChambeau is going to lead the way here. It is notable that Sergio Garcia, who has won this event twice, of course, not at TPC Craig Ranch over the last 24 rounds is actually second on this list. Uh, you see Cam Champ, Jonathan Vegas, and Thomas Peters also rounding it out. Peters only has a couple of rounds and John Rahm would be your next best thing with Keith Mitchell right behind. Uh, a distance I think is certainly going to be valuable here because again, I don't think accuracy is all that much of an issue. So if you look at the last 24 rounds of the Bombers, Wyndham Clark gets a, a boost without having to worry about accuracy. Cameron Champ, Will Gordon, Luke List also getting a boost. And then Bryson DeChambeau rounding out the top five there as well. And then if I was looking for birdie makers, you know, you can look by birdies per round over the last 24. Jordan Spieth atop that list. Sam Burns, this should be another good spot for Sam Burns. Daniel Berger, Bryson DeChambeau, and Brooks Kepko. We'll certainly talk about him because he is back this week. So those are the types of players that I'm looking for. We are doing a lot of guessing, uh, but I'm going to take upside. I'm going to take distance, and I'm going to take birdie ability this week. Let's go take a look at the cheat sheet. Six golfers over $10,000 led by Dustin Johnson. Bryson DeChambeau is in there. John Rahm, Jordan Spieth, Hideki Matsuyama, and Daniel Berger. Let me just run through a couple of these guys really quickly. Daniel Berger, I'm a 5 out of 10. I'm always basically a 5 out of 10 on Daniel Berger. I worry a little bit about the distance, but he makes a ton of birdies here. He can he can get it done basically anywhere. Um, I think $10,100 is a fair price. I don't think it's great. I don't think it's terrible. Hideki Matsuyama, I share a little bit of concern about. Uh, 
just because this is his first start since the Masters, we know about all of the responsibilities that you have as a major champion, especially getting one for the first time in your career, especially having to go back to Japan and go through. I mean, he was just, he got the hero's welcome, right? He had to do the two week quarantine. He met with, um, with, uh, their, he's not their president. I think he's their prime minister. It's, it's a lot. And I wonder how much that took away from maybe his practice ability. I will take a bit of a more, uh, cautious approach with Hideki Matsuyama. So that leaves us with four guys above $10,000 that I think we need to talk about. Dustin Johnson seemingly would set up for any course on the face of the earth, but we're not seeing particularly good play from DJ, especially by his own lofty standards. If we load up this field and we go back to, um, and we, and we pull up DJ here, you're going to see it's kind of been a couple of different things that have that have hurt him over the over the past couple of starts. All of the tees been generally just fine. Some weeks he has the approach game, some weeks he doesn't. The short game has let him down. Sometimes the putter, I mean, he lost 10 strokes uh, putting at the workday. He gained five at the RBC Heritage. He's just kind of all over the place. So I certainly would not be considering Dustin Johnson as an option this week or as a consistent option this week. Excuse me. If you want to buy into the volatility, if you want to look at what his ownership is on Wednesday and take a calculated risk, this is an interesting spot to take a calculated risk on the number one player in the world. Uh, Bryson DeChambeau is certainly the guy that I was looking at uh, and, you know, I don't know how this doesn't set up well for him, right? Let's like let's set this up for Bryson and let's look back at what he did last week. And it was a really, really weird week for Bryson DeChambeau. He lost five strokes on approach, um, which is incredibly poor. He made a triple bogey on the easiest hole on the course. That was number seven. He made a double bogey on Friday, or I guess it was on Saturday on 18. He played the par fives at even par, which is never going to happen again. He flew home, had to fly back on Saturday morning at two o'clock in the morning, still posted nearly the round of the day. So all of that going on, all of these negative things that we saw from Bryson last week, he finished ninth. Yeah, that's right. I actually looked this up in my database here. Uh, he is now the only golfer since 2015 to lose five strokes or more on approach, or 5.25, to lose as much as he did, and still finish inside the top 10. I, I don't like. I, I guess you could say that's a good thing. You could say it's a bad thing. I look at it and say, even when things go as south as they could go for Bryson, he found a way to finish inside the top 10. And now... I mean, go watch the flyover. I swear. I just and just picture Bryson knocking the ball around there. There there seems to be little rough. Uh, there seems to be a lot of area to to miss if you're going to miss. I think he could just I think he could just destroy this. I don't know. I don't think he's gonna play the par fives at even par again. Uh, I just I just really think you you know, 70 of his 72 holes last week um were pretty good and and the metrics aren't there. So that's that's kind of where we're at with Bryson. Uh that leaves us with John Rahm. Rom to me, let me try to illustrate something for you. I I know a lot of us got burned by John Rom last week. You know, I was certainly high on him. He was and there was no reason not to be. He was entering last week with eight uh top tens in his last ten starts. He had gained strokes off the tee in twenty six in a row. Now that's up to twenty seven. There was really no reason to not like John Rom. And let's look at what he actually did. This is the live leaderboard. This is on rickrungood.com. I'll zoom in a little bit here so you can see this. And uh, Rom is right here. So he threw two, let's just look at what he did through two rounds. Cause those, those are the only two rounds that he played. He gained two and a half strokes off the tape. Phenomenal. That's like eighth in this field through the first two rounds. It was great. He was a slight positive approach player. So let's add those together. That's ball striking, right? So ball striking through the first two rounds. John Rahm was better than Bryson DeChambeau by a mile. Uh, Justin Thomas by a mile. Um, he was better than, let's see. Victor Hovland, he was better than Patrick Cantlay. Now, Cantlay also missed the cut, but you're talking about Hovland, who finished third, uh, JT, who finished uh, T26, uh, Bryson, who finished T9, and John Rahm gets gets sent home packing because of his short game. So, uh, And his short game is 
one of the better parts of his game, right? I mean, he's been he's been excellent over the last couple of years uh, around the greens and on the greens. But when you lose essentially four shots in two rounds over over those two categories, uh, that's what sends him packing. And it's to me, that's unlikely to happen again. Uh, I would rather take the positive of the really good ball striking over those first two rounds compared to some of these guys that went on to do really great things over the course of the rest of the week. So I'll be thrilled. Um, I'll be interested to see what this what this projected ownership number is come Wednesday or so. Um, but but Rom has my full attention, and I'm gonna wait and see what the what the general public does. Jordan Spieth, 10,700. Last guy we have to talk about here in the 10K range. And no matter how you slice this, uh, Jordan Spieth's name seemingly comes out on top for a lot of different metrics. So let's just go since the start of uh, January. It's January 2021. Since the start of the calendar year, let's sort this by strokes gained total, which means who's the best player. And Jordan Spieth is that guy. The only golfer gaining over two strokes per round, 2.02. Brooks Kepka is right behind, but he's at one point. Six, so it's a pretty significant gap. Uh, this this is an, just an incredibly impressive stretch of golf that we are seeing from Spieth, and he's doing it in every single category. He's gaining off the tee, he's gaining on approach, he's gaining around the greens, and he's gaining putting. So he's creating this really high floor that has essentially turned into, let's see, um, one, two, three, four, five, six, six of his last seven stroke play events, he's finished inside the top 15, Five of them are top fives. He has a victory. So he's not only got the floor at the moment, but he also has the ceiling as well. Very, very interested in Jordan Spieth this week. Okay, the $9,000 range. Brooks Kepka back in action this week. Uh, I don't really know what to expect from Brooks, although I know that when he, uh, when he plays, he plays well. Right, that's kind of what we've seen. I assume that if he's playing, he's going to be healthy. I was shocked that he even tried to play at the Masters, um, misses the cut, but guts it out over two days. Uh, seemingly, he's had a couple of weeks to get right, to get healthy, and he's only playing because he feels good about it. He's only a couple of starts removed from that win at Phoenix. Um, I'll be, again, very interested to see what the public does with him. Matt Fitzpatrick, quick note, uh, Matt Fitzpatrick actually officially changed his name with the PGA Tour a couple of weeks ago to from Matthew Fitzpatrick to Matt Fitzpatrick, so I've had to update the entire database. If you see any issues, if you see where like there might be two of Fitzpatrick's or whatever, just give me a shout. Should be a pretty easy way to fix it, but he has been uh, unbelievably impressive. He's $9,500, and I want to go back to the Holy Grail here because I want to get rid of you know, I'm opening this up not to just players in this field, but basically everybody on tour. And if you sort by strokes gain total, there are a couple of names that stand out. We already mentioned Jordan Spieth, 2.02 strokes gained per round. Charlie Hoffman is right behind at 1.72 and also at 1.72 is Matt Fitzpatrick. That's how good he's been. You could argue he's been the third best player on tour or the second best player because he's tied with Charlie Hoffman on tour since the start of the 2021 season. And look at how he's doing it. A guy that we don't normally think of as a long hitter and he's not particularly long, but gains a ton of strokes off the tee. His iron game has started to get sorted out a little bit. And then his, his, what used to be his crutch, his short game is still magic, right? Sometimes when we see these golf find gains in one category they lose them in another and that really hasn't been the case for Fitzpatrick here he's kind of figured both sides of it out so uh, really impressive stuff I, I cannot um I, I cannot describe how how impressed I am now will distance hurt him this week I would say yes, but he has proven that it has not been a hindrance already at a couple of, of long tracks this year. So uh, Matt Fitzpatrick, uh, certainly for me, one of the most improved players of the 2021 year, and, and it doesn't seem to be stopping anytime soon. We're going to get plenty of the Scotty Scheffler in Texas narrative this week. That's fine. We're going to get plenty of the Ryan Palmer narrative this week, 9,100. Actually, I'd probably prefer to bet him. His betting odds uh, much longer than than what they kind of translate to here in the DFS market. He holds the course record here. That's You're going to hear that 100 times this week. But the guy who's really, uh, again, I, I know that I'm, I, I don't know if I have a blind spot, maybe just a blind uh, attraction to Sam Burns, who, who, who plays great. Uh, 
at at the Zurich with with Billy Horschel, goes out and wins at the at the Valspar, gets a week off. I kind of like that. After your after your first win, getting a, a week to kind of just talk to everybody, get your congratulations, deal with your newfound media obligations and reset a little bit. You don't have to play the next week. This should be a perfect spot for Sam Burns. I mean, he is just absolutely brilliant off the tee. Let's pull this up. We know what uh, the upside is. We know that if he puts four rounds together, he probably wins the golf tournament. He makes a ton of birdies, which is going to be uh, critical this week. He's seventh on tour in birdie average. He's 20th in driving distance. He's actually 46th off the tee. So what does that say? It means he doesn't hit a lot of fairways. That seems to be okay at TPC Craig Ranch. So this is a pretty good spot for him. Guys like Sam Burns, guys like Cameron Davis. I'm not even sure if Davis is in the is in the um, in the field this week. I don't think he is. But guys like that who are you know gaining a lot of strokes off the tee, but maybe they do it because of distance and not so much accuracy. This feels like a good spot to run those guys out because I don't think it's going to hurt this week. So Sam Burns ninety three hundred dollars to me feels like a really good number. As we get into the $8,000 range, let's go back to the Holy Grail and let's just pump this in for, um, you know, let's just let's just go by everybody in this field since the start of 2021, sort by strokes gain total, and let's start seeing the first, you know, $8,000 guys, $8, guys that we see. Uh, Siwoo Kim's in here. He's played 37 rounds. He's gaining nearly a stroke per round. Uh, excellent off the tee and on approach at the RBC Heritage. It is He has been dialed in with his irons. He has gained strokes on approach in six consecutive events. He has gained strokes on approach in 10 of his last 13. When things go sideways, they go really, really sideways. So he's certainly not a uh, consistent option, but he's been playing well enough to be considered here. He's 8,800. Next would be Luke List. This is a little bit steep for me. You know, $8,400 for Luke List is scary, but this should be a really good spot for him. He's coming off a sixth place finish at the Wells Fargo Championship where he gained over five strokes off the tee and started to figure out the putter. In fact, he's been putting a lot better recently. If you go back, I mean, we can... We, we don't have to. We can do this. We can go back and we can look. Look at the putter from this would be the end of 2020 into the start of 2021. He did not have an event in which he gained strokes putting between August and February. It's brutal. And a lot of them, he's losing seven strokes, four strokes, five strokes. That has been his Achilles heel. Well, uh, look at what he's done recently. Since Phoenix, he has gained strokes putting in Six of, no, that's more, four, five, six, six of nine, six of nine. He's still capable of losing five strokes putting in a week like he did at the RBC Heritage, but he's putting together a much better tournaments as of late. And now he's a guy that is, you know, brilliant off the tee. We can look at his golfer profile and we can see kind of how he shakes up or shakes out, excuse me, for this. And you'll see uh, driving accuracy, 182nd. Strokes gained off the tee, 7th. Why is that? Because he's a bomber, baby. He hits it far, 313 yards on average. That's 7th longest on tour. Makes a ton of eagles, makes enough birdies. Uh, this, to me, would be one of the better spots for Luke List. He is only $8,400. We go back to that holy grail. We continue to look for our $8,000 golfers. Thomas Peters is here. He's got... Uh, a couple of really good finishes in a row, right? 13th at Punta Cana, uh, 15th at the Puerto Rico Open, 8th at the Zurich Classic. He's got some more results on the European Tour uh, and only 69 rounds uh, for for this. Oh, excuse me. I, I guess I should. I changed my, um, excuse me here. I changed I changed the date range for Luke List and I forgot to change it back. So let's try this again. So after Siwoo Kim was Luke List and then our next $8,000 golfer was Matt Kuchar at 82 and Lee Westwood at 8,500. I'm not as excited about those golfers, but uh, they are certainly coming popping up on the model. One last guy we have to talk about in the $8,000 range is Keith Mitchell. So um, before I flip over to his Holy Grail, there's a couple of things. Mitchell played well the Zurich with Brant Snedeker. We know the quote from Snedeker that said like, if he was playing by himself, he would have won. Like I held him back. Remember there was a round where he made back-to-back -back Eagles. Um, he, he's been playing well for an extended period of time. At Valspar, he loses that nine strokes putting. Remember I tweeted about how that was the worst round in my database? Well, we found out a couple of days later he had a bent putter. Well, what does he go out and do last week? He goes out and he gains a bunch of strokes putting. So let's pull up Keith Mitchell here and see what he's been up to. 
here he is. So, Wells Fargo Championship, he gains three and a half strokes putting. Here's the 12 he lost at the Valspar. Again, nine of that coming in one round. And this really shouldn't be all that much of a surprise that Keith Mitchell is just ball striking the heck out of it because this is kind of what he does. Phenomenal off the tee last week. He's gained strokes off the tee in four in a row, five of his last six. He has not lost a stroke or more off the tee since last year's Houston Open. That was in November, so very consistent in that category. He's a bit more volatile with the approaches, but he's figuring it out. He's got three gainers there in a row, and that doesn't even include the fourth place finish at Zurich, which again, we assume if there were strokes gain metrics for that event, it would be phenomenal uh, because of what he did with Brant Snedeker. So uh, the, again, we talked about this with Keegan Bradley last week, and we talk about this often the perception for Keith Mitchell last week will be negative because he quote unquote blew a two shot lead heading into Sunday, had it out to three shots after one hole and he lost the tournament. Uh, it is no small feat to get into the final group on a Sunday at, at Quail Hollow. And also if Rory McIlroy beats you, he beats you. The metrics popped up. If you told me before the week that Keith Mitchell was going to finish third, I think you'd be thrilled with that. I think we run him right back out there at a very fair $8,000 price, quite frankly. The $7,000 range, um, you know, there's a couple of guys that I think we need to do a deeper dive into. One of them is Peter Uline. I don't always do this, but let me pull up his official World Golf ranking page because he splits time between the Corn Ferry and the PGA Tour. Again on the Corn Ferry last week, a top 10, finished T7. Uh, has, has So now his last, let's see, his last four Corn Ferry Tour events, he has a seventh, a win, a missed cut, and a runner-up. That's strong. His last handful of PGA Tour events, T57 at Valspar. Then he went and finished T22 at Punta Cana, T39 at the Puerto Rico Open, T60 at Pebble Beach. So he has only missed one cut across both tours. I mean, dating back to last year, that is four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten events. And he's playing really, really well on the Corn Ferry. I, I just continue to keep an eye on Peter Uline because of how, how strong he's been. And then the other guy that's also in this range and the other guy that we need to do an official World Golf ranking dive into because uh, you might not know who he is. It's John Catlin, the American who plays on the European Tour. And not only does he play... He wins. He won a couple of weeks ago the Austrian Golf Open. He has now won three times in his last 15 starts on the European Tour. He won uh, back in Spain at the in the middle of last year. He won a couple weeks after that in Ireland. He does miss a lot of cuts. He is a more volatile golfer, but his last start just in Spain again uh, a couple of weeks ago, this would have been, I guess, two weeks ago, uh, was a fifth-place finish. So this is... I, I just really like the way... His game is stacking up here. Uh, he wins a lot. I don't think he's going to win this golf tournament, but he certainly holds his own. He's the 78th ranked player in the world, uh, and certainly for good reason. The rest of this 7K range leaves a lot to be desired, quite frankly. You know, Ben Martin had a good finish last week. He finished 11th, and he was pretty solid in every category. I think the only place he lost was off the tee last week, and he was just kind of a small gainer across the board. Scott Stallings, I have significant concerns about. He gained like five and a half strokes putting something crazy last week. That's probably not going to happen again. So I'm not as excited about the rest of this 7K range. Johnny Vegas, who is a real elite player off the tee at a course where I think that is going to be important. That is somewhat interesting, but I'm probably going to stick with Uline, with Catlin. I'd even I'd even go back to Carlos Ortiz. He had a couple of big numbers that, I mean, he was in contention, I guess, on I think it was on Saturday. He was in this thing. In, in this thing. And then he just, you know, the, it's a knife's edge out there at, at Quail Hollow. And if you're on the wrong side of it, things get out of control in a hurry. And that's exactly what happened for Carlos Ortiz. I would not mind buying back in on that. The $6,000 range. Um, yeah, it's it's pretty ugly. Oh, I'm sorry. One, one more in the 7,000. Vincent Whaley did it again right? He was a, a large focus of our attention last week, 26 at the Wells Fargo Championship. So what are we talking about with Whaley now? All, all the guy does, is he finishes between 26th and 36th every single event. He's done it for like seven in a row, eight in a row. It's, it's really crazy stuff. He has been, um, actually, let's just look up what he did last week because, you know, he was, let's see, 
Whaley was, yeah, this is what he does. He's basically a very average player in all categories. He was within two and a half strokes of zero in every category. That's that's kind of what I expect. And if he continues to do that, he's going to continue to uh, be a, a, a decent option for a T29. Let's get some assistance from the Holy Grail here on the $6,000 guys. And we're going to treat this the same way that we did for the $8,000 guys. We're going to start since the start of uh, 2021, and we are going to look for uh, just the best players until we find the 6K range guys, and we're going to see if I can find somebody with some sample size. A couple guys off the top that have like two rounds. Okay, Boho, he would be the best player. He's $6,500. He's, wow, he's the best player? Well, he, he gained all of those at the start of the year because he has missed seven consecutive cuts. So I think we can give... Him a pass, and we can continue to roll on here. K.H. Lee, 6,900. Okay, K.H. Lee's made five cuts in a row. If he made a cut at 6,900, you'd be pretty happy about that. I'm concerned that he does it a lot. Well, uh, well, he loses a lot of strokes putting. I'll, I'll say that. Uh, he has not gained putting in any significant way uh, since Phoenix. That's That would be... A little bit concerning, but at least he's a pretty good off the tee player. He's a decent ball striker. KH Lee, 6,900. Andrew Putnam, ooh, hemorrhages strokes off the tee. That would be a little bit of a concern. He's gained, five, he's lost, um, he's missed the cut in five of his last six. Roger Sloan had a heck of a weekend, I believe, last week. He would be next. Again, misses a lot of cuts. This $6,900 range is a real bummer. So let's try this. If we're not going to find. Maybe guys playing well at the moment. Let's see if we can find fit. So let's do last 24 rounds and let's do strokes gained off the tee and see if I can find some golfers in the $6,000 range. Okay, Will Gordon, 6,800, gains about a half a stroke off the tee. Doesn't make a ton of birdies, but not bad. After that, Hunter Mahan, same thing, but he hemorrhages three times that on approach. Danny Lee, who is always a WD risk, would be next on this list. Man, this is a really, really ugly. Let's try something different. Let's try birdie percentage. I'm, I'm trying anything I can to find some guys. Josh Teeter, 6,600, makes a ton of birdies, has a few less rounds than other guys, and he is a plus ball striker and relatively close to zero across the board. That might not be bad. Teeter might be the guy here. 6,600, Big-time birdie maker in those last 24 rounds. Solid, or I, I mean, he's he's within a quarter of a stroke of zero in every category. So he's basically an average player, which at 6,600 is probably more than you can certainly desire. So, okay, let's go with that. I had to work hard to find some guys in the $6,000 range. That was a little bit scary. Maybe the lineup builder will help. So let's uh, go over and run a little model. I had a ton of success with this last week um, in in the birdie. I I had again Saturday. I was winning the thing. It 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 gave me a lot of Rory because we um, weighed off the tee so heavily. So we're gonna try something uh, also. And I, and I kept a smaller time frame, which I think I'm gonna continue this week. So I'm gonna go with the last 24 rounds. And again, I don't have the course key stats to work off of of what this model should look like. So I'm gonna do a lot of guessing based on what I've seen this week. I think off the tee is gonna be critical. Let's call it 30. I think distance, which I don't want to de necessarily double count, but I do think it's going to be really important. So give me 15 there. Give me uh, birdie makers, a lot of them. Give me 25 there. That leaves me with 30. So then let me do 15 on, whoops, not 125, 15 on approach. That leaves me with 10 around the green and five putting. I'll do kind of do a modified weighted strokes gained, heavy on distance, heavy on birdie or better. Let's sort this by value. And oh boy, you know who it is. You know the big boy at the top is Bryson DeChambeau. His value scored 92. Shockingly, a name that we kind of glossed over for the narrative, Scotty Scheffler's a 91. Right behind Bryson DeChambeau, he's been phenomenal off the tee. He's been even better on approach. He's been great around the green. They've basically been, Scotty Scheffler's been better tee to green in the last 24 rounds. Makes a ton of birdies too. Wow. Scotty Scheffler's basically been Bryson DeChambeau in the last 20 rounds. That's awesome stuff. Uh, and he's like $1,800 less expensive. Brooks Kepka for me is third. 
Daniel Berger is fourth. That's shocking because even though he lacks the distance of some of these other guys, he's a big gainer off the tee. Makes more birdies in that time frame than Bryson does. Wow, very good. John Robbs, my fifth ranked golfer. Sergio Garcia, six. DJ, seven. Jordan Spieth, eight. Oh my goodness. Johnny Vegas did, okay, Johnny Vegas and Cage Lee did pop up as the two guys that would be kind of my better values down here at the bottom. So wow, this is really surprising. I'm going to have to do a deeper dive on Scotty Scheffler. That seems to be a really good spot for him. Uh, maybe give a bit more love to Daniel Berger. Maybe consider J Jonathan Vegas and KH Lee to round out some lineups. But wow, very, very interesting stuff. Okay, good to know. Um, that'll do it for this week's DFS preview for the AT&T Byron Nelson. Obviously, plenty more content coming this week. And we are gearing up, baby, for the PGA Championship. Let's go. Let's do it. For now, you can tweet me, at Rick Run Good. You can leave a comment below. Best of luck, and I'll talk to you guys soon.